Hello everyone, and thanks for joining my talk today, and uh, thanks to our amazing organizers, uh, especially Quark also for inviting me here. So I'll talk today about a little project I've been nursing for a while now. Uh, it's called Bloop, and I'll give a quick tour. And oh yeah, right, it is a fluid solver running on GPU. So, but first at the stage first, a little bit. Um, so about myself, uh, you find me online as Wumpf usually on Twitter and GitHub and wherever. And uh, I've been working for Qual actually uh, for a while, uh, actually already in game engines. So currently I'm working for Unity. Um, but notably, like all everything I'm showing you today is all like a hobby project. So I've actually never been professionally working on rendering or physics for that matter. Um, so take everything with a grain of salt. You know, like there might be some inner curiosity here and there. And uh, yeah, and when I'm not writing on these things, I'm occasionally also contributing to WebGPU, which unsurprisingly the whole thing is also based on. Right. So uh, yeah, what, what is Bloop? Right. Uh, what are we talking about today? So it is a somewhat real-time GPU fluid simulation. It, it was completely real-time at some point, but then I focused on correctness and it got slower. So, but it's still quite interactive on my machine. And uh, yes, as I already mentioned, it's powered by WebGPU, very proudly so. And um, right, yeah, it's written in Rust and GLSL, which makes up quite a sizable portion of the project. And as I already mentioned, like the whole thing is a side project, so I, I really wanted to get into WebGPU and uh, learn more about fluid sims. I did some experimentation before. So uh, yeah, I worked on this like on and off for a year. Uh, it's, it's gathering a little bit dust now, but I, I might still do some more updates. Um, so for those of you who know uh, a little bit of fluid simulation, you already like the buzzwords. Uh, so the whole thing is a, a fine particle in cell solver. Uh, I'll, I'll give a little bit of overview of what that means later. And um, the application itself uh, supports, sadly, only solid to fluid interactions. So that means, uh, yeah, well, I mean, in short, that means no floating duckies, right? So like the water sadly can't push around uh, any solid object, so uh, that that may be for another time, um, but not in this solver. All right, and with this, I come to a like brief overview of what we're actually going to do. So uh, after this introduction, now I'll, I'll show a brief demo, and I'll just show you what the program basically can do without going into too much detail. Hopefully, the stream will will send you more than just a few MPEG artifacts, but I'll I'll just halt it every now and then. And uh, then we'll look at like how fluid simulations work roughly. Uh, I won't go into a lot of detail and also won't go a lot of detail on the next point, but more so, which is uh, a few implementation details I found interesting. And uh, we're also not talking about rendering today. First of all, it was not a big focus of the project. And on the other hand, it's like just out of time, right? Um, I did spend some time on there. So if you're curious, like maybe you can make a follow up or you just Ask me or write to me somewhere. All right, and with that, I'll go into a demo. So to make this extra authentic, I'll, I'll start this right here from, from where it all lives. And go, here it is. So, um, so this is my little fluid sim. I see it is interactive, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get to like the timing issues later a little bit. So I halt it. So. This should also hopefully look good in the stream. Uh, this, is, by the way, is the WebGPU logo, which uh, Quark allowed me to use for this. Um, right. So um, yeah, as I mentioned, like, let's just look a little bit at what this little guy can do. Um, so I have different scenes there, like defined in tiny JSON files, very primitive. So this one is always, yeah, it's very splashy because we have this object moving around in here. But uh, personally, I'm more a fan of the the less splashy ones. Oh, no, that's still very splashy. Uh, oh, yeah, that, that is my favorite. I spent a lot of time in there trying to get it somewhat right. And yeah, it, it works. It works. So, and um, we are splashing away. Um, so, where to start with the controls, right? You can see the, the timing up here. Um, so, yeah, that, that's what I already mentioned here. So, we see a render time. I'm not sure if you can read that in the screen, uh, in the in the stream. But what we're seeing is actually the render time is ahead of the simulated time, uh, which is a typical problem in um, in simulations. At some point, you just need to give up. So this is not actually real time right now. Right? So this is slowed down 
so we can still see a fluid picture which is then rendered with 30 fps uh, it's always a quite nasty trade-off um but if you probably if, if you follow me on twitter so you've seen me post videos so um you, you may call the cheating but the whole thing is is geared towards like a, a semi-offline thing so you actually can tell okay i i want to record a video and that's my target fps so with a target fps and we essentially would like make sure that that simulated time the render time is keeping up um so in that case it would be quite a bit faster all right um what else interesting we have here oh yeah uh personally i like this mode much better because it tells us a bit of what's actually going on so um we already see like there's there's something partly particle going on i'll, I'll talk more about that later uh, but basically this just shows the velocity of of the the particles as a heat map and uh yeah maybe some more interesting scene um i think i had a bunny here somewhere oh yeah here's a bunny it doesn't move everybody loves a bunny yeah it's a cute little bunny um right um right and uh, it also comes with a profiler so this uses uh, a creator I wrote myself, which basically just does uh, a buffered web GPU timer queries. And we get a nice tree of how the whole thing works. Uh, I'll also look into that later more a little bit. Um, right, and there's a separate profiling for the rendering, uh, which actually the, the right now we're running with two simulation frames per simulated frame. Oh, wait, no, the other way around. <laughs> Two simulation steps for um yes <laughs> something like that um all right uh, maybe one more scene just for fun uh oh yeah this one is nice so here we have like uh, a wave generator set up where we have this box moving back and forth uh, which keeps our fluid nice and excited and gives us these really pretty waves and oh yeah probably i should halt this every now and then it's like the particles will probably that on the stream. All right, so here we see these nice things. And back to the rendering, which I'm not gonna talk about much today. <laughs> right, there we go. Yeah, a lot of fun. The the one thing I said I also didn't implement is like moving an object uh, manually, but in theory that should be possible. It shouldn't be too challenging. All right, uh, I'll keep this guy running here in the background so we can go um, back to it when we look at the different parts of what's actually going on in here. All right, uh, back to the slides. Where's my mouse? There we go. Right, so that was our little first initial demo. So this is what the project is all about, like splashy fluids in a tank. And with that, I want to take a very quick tour of like how fluid simulation actually works. So uh, anybody who knows the area would probably be bored and point out my mistakes, but uh, this is for everyone else and myself to gather thoughts on this. All right, so you can't really do a, a fluid simulation talk without putting up this guy. Uh, so this is the Navy Stokes equation for incompressible fluids. Uh, but I'm not going to go through the math, math here, right? Because uh, I, that would take too long and it's, it's very confusing and requires a lot of other concepts. But it's still useful having this equation here because we can break it down. Right, we can break it down into the different parts that we need to solve to like write the fluid simulator, like like blue. So, and um, I figured actually out that, like every part has an emoji. Uh, so the thing the equation is actually describing is like an acceleration change. Uh, well, a pardon, a uh, a velocity change, which is an acceleration. So that was we're computing at every point in space. So since we're computing at every point in space, we need to like take into account what other fluid moves in, right? So like if you imagine a river at a, bit, a given point, there's like new stuff moving inwards and it also would like move material with it. So that's called advection. And we use this little puff emoji here, uh, wind emoji, I think it's officially. Then we have external forces like gravity. So that's pretty straightforward. We have viscosity, which is what makes our stuff more um, well, less viscous, like water, or more viscous, like honey. And we have pressure, which essentially tells you, like, yeah, you, you can't go there because there's already too much. Um, and then there's this extra guy. This is very important to actually solve the equation, which tells us we, like, we can't make up stuff. Right? So that's why we have this little exploding guy. We don't want them. We don't want this emoji here. 
Uh, so we need to remove the divergence. And we can actually simplify this a bit more because so now I kicked out the kicked out my, my honeypot, the viscosity. Um, and uh, th that is because typically when we do more interactive simulations, um, we have the problem that due, due to numerical problem, instabilities, we're already like making our fluid more honey-like. So actually, we already have too much of that. That's also sometimes called numerical viscosity. So that's why we just leave that out here. Um, but it would be still relevant if we wanted to do like something, something, uh, something like a molasses or, or oil for that matter. It doesn't always need to be honey. Right, and I already renamed our external forces to gravity because that's the only one we really care. And yeah, then the question is, this is of course back to the question, okay, like the, the above equation makes sense, but yeah, where do I get my pressure from? And what is the divergence? And yeah, this is where a lot of the magic happens. So actually we're using this condition of divergence being zero to solve a pressure equation, which is a differential equation. But well, since we're a computer, everything is discrete and in the end it's just a linear equation like a, a linear equation system that we need to solve for every simulation step yeah there you have it right so these are like the basic basic parts that any kind of simulation a fluid simulation needs so now we've got to talk about how we how we go about this like how do we simulate such a system and there's two main ways of thinking about a fluid when you're a computer, that is. <laughs> right, so um, uh, on the left, we have the Eulerian approach, it's a grid, it's just a fancy term for that, essentially. And on the right, the Lagrangian particles. So the one on the right is quite intuitive. You see it in a lot of uh, simulations. So if you have heard of smooth particle hydrodynamics, SPH, that is the thing on the right. And if you're more into finite elements or similar techniques, that's more the thing on the left. And uh, yeah, as you can see, like we have quantities either defined at cell middle points or on um, well on particles. Now, a small detail I will go into later again is that here we actually have the the like the quantities like well what color does this have or how heavy is it? We have that in the middle, whereas the velocities are on the sides. But you could argue that's just an implementation detail. Right. So what should we use? Should we use Particles or should we use grids? What, what's better? So there, there's a clear trade-off as always. So the, the puff, the, the little cloud thing I, I, out there is trivial with particles because as I said, it's all about like moving things on, right? Yeah, sure, like, just move the particles on. In a grid deck, it's a bit tricky, right? Because you somehow need to blur it out and yeah, you get a lot of error in there than in. So that's kind of hard to do with a grid. And on the other hand, uh, on the other hand, the pressure surface is relatively easy with a grid because you have like this defined space. It's very easy to create derivatives to like see where things are going, which with particles is hard. You need to like look at your neighbors and where are your neighbors anyway? It's changing all the time. So, um, well, why not? Why not do both, right? And that's that's where the APIC and all the other techniques come in. Uh, so this graph is actually from the affine particle itself methods by stuff with the little emojis I introduced earlier. And this outlines the basic idea of all hybrid techniques. So on the left here I have this box with the particles. And on the right we have the grid. So the idea is like, yeah, let's just do whatever works best on each side. So we do all the dynamics, like the, the actual advancing of our particles and the, the forces we do in the particle space then we transfer that to a grid and do our pressures over there. And then we go back and so forth, right? So this is basically our loop. We switch back and forth from particles to grid. And yeah, the interesting thing is actually like after the transition, we can throw away what we had with the particles almost. Well, I mean, we still keep the positions because they're important, but like all the, the velocity information, all the information goes over to the grid and it goes back. And uh, that, we can actually see that in here. In blue. So I already showed you the particles. So, but yeah, what about the grid, right? So the grid we can also visualize. And what we have here is a marker grid first and foremost. So we have the um, black cells. They're all filled out, they're solid, right? So we have this artificial solid one here. And we have our big block. 
right? So the block is maybe more pretty in another scene. So let's go back to our attribute rotating scene. Ooh, where is it? Oh, there it is. I've got to swirl this around a bit. See? Uh, at least I got to set a bit. So there we go. All right. So again, we have here a very clearly defined grid. And I can even turn off the particles here and we see, like, oh, yeah, it's, it's all a lie. It's all just, it's just a grid. Uh, right. And also on the grid, we can look at uh, the lot. Yeah. Oh, that, that is hard to tweak. Yeah. Now we have like little velocities everywhere in the grid, but they're a bit too hard to see. Uh, I doubt you can recognize anything in the stream in this in the stream. All right. So now uh, we established that part. Right. And um, now the rest of the talk, we look at some interesting aspect of the implementation of Bloop. Now that we have a rough understanding of what we're solving. So uh, first of all, yeah, it's computers, right? So everything in Bloop pretty much is a computer with a few exceptions. And the whole thing is in GLSL mostly because at the time uh, the web GPU lang uh, shading language wasn't there yet, right? When I started, there was none. And uh, yeah, porting this at this point is, would be quite involved. Although worthwhile, I'm sure you could learn something there. Um, right, and I do most uh, most of the things that I do on image 3D. So if you're familiar with GLSL, that's just like the term for having a 3D volume, a volume texture. And we do a lot of read and writes on those. And uh, yeah, you see here on the right, so if you're a WebGP user, you might be interested in this. Like these are all the native extensions that I need right now. Uh, nothing too unusual except the conservative rasterization. I'll talk about that later. And uh, yes, yeah, sadly, because of all these things, the whole thing doesn't run on metal. But very much to my surprise, it runs out of the box on Linux. I'm, I'm totally pumped about that. I've been doing this on Windows all the time. And yeah, it just works on Linux. I never tried before. And flawlessly, it's yeah, pretty amazing, this Web thing, I must say. <laughs> right, so uh, what are the different steps of Bloop, right? So like, what is the pipeline? I tried to outline that here, again, with our emojis from earlier. So I already heard like there's a velocity, like a particle to grid step. Like um, actually it's just the velocities. We're not moving anything else to the grid. Then we compute the divergence. We remember that is the thing that should be zero. And then we do a pressure solver. That takes a lot of iterations. And, but out of that comes a pressure value and that we can then remove from the grid. And that's fairly easy. And now that we have that, we can expand the grid a little so that when we read those velocities back that we actually get all of, um, valid values that we can interpolate. So that's essentially just like, yeah, like sampling, uh, sampling a grid with a linear filter, a volume texture. And then we have particles that we can add back. And that is the core of it. But as you can tell, I left a bit, a little bit of space here. So we also want solids. And you've seen like some of the solids even move. So we need to like get some representation that the particles can read which is why I voxelize them every frame. And I also need to set boundary markers for that then. Right, and yeah, that, that I'm also not going to talk about. We repeat the whole thing again uh, because I'm implementing a very amazing paper, a link is here in the slides, called Implicit Density Projection, which counteracts a problem a lot of these techniques have, which is uh, loss of volume. And uh, yeah, to demonstrate, I should have let this running because I can let this run for quite a while and the fluid will not settle down, uh, at least not very much. Um, so that's pretty cool and it allows me also to like do much bigger timestamps. But to be honest, it's also the reason why I'm no longer perfectly real time. Before that I was, but it was, it was more buggy. So, well, trade-offs. Right. Um, and yeah, we already, I already mentioned like I have a profile in here, right? So actually most of the stuff in the profile here, um, uh, I'll do this back in life. Um, put the rendering on, the simulation. Oh, I crashed. Oh, we, we didn't see that. Yeah, yeah. nothing crashed. It crashed. You're all with me. Um, right, yeah, there we go. I think it's a profiler. Right. So, and yeah, we see like here we have the transfer step, we have the pressure solver, we have the divergence tree. So, like most of the boxes have a direct representation here. I, I left out some of the clear steps. And um, yeah, as we also can tell, uh, yeah, they're not, they are not born equal, right? So uh, what's really slow is the pressure solve and the transfer. 
And notably, the voxelization is incredibly fast, actually. That was only 0 0.1 millisecond. And I think that screenshot is from the scene with the bunny, which is, uh, had a, has a bit more triangles than the rest. Um, all right. So I, I promised I'm going to like look into a few of the details. And I picked the most interesting three steps out here, which is the voxelize, the velocity to grid, and the pressure solve. Right, let's start with the voxelize. Uh, first, let's go back to the demo so we can actually appreciate what's going on here. Um, so let's see, uh, let me turn off the fluid so we can focus solely on this little beauty. And, uh, oh yeah, there's a voxelize visualization. And yeah, we see it's fully covering actually. And uh, yeah, well, it's done in real time. And uh, it's uh, colored in a beautiful pink. Uh, that is because uh, the whole thing needs to store velocity vectors again in the grid. So we know that if a fluid particle lives right here, oh, then it should be pushed. Um, so yeah, that we need to store in here as well. And uh, yeah, I mentioned the bunny earlier. There it is, our little friend. Yeah, I need to quickly run. Uh, yeah, the bunny is not moving. That's why it's black, right? So yeah, voxelization. And yeah, well, okay, yeah. I mean, if it wasn't clear already, like we need to do this so a particle can do like a random lookup uh, in space, right? Because the particle is checking against triangles, that would be challenging. Uh, maybe with the more modern uh, ray tracing uh, data structures, uh, maybe that's an option, but it's still desirable to just like look into the grid, which they can have the similar resolution in our actual computation grid. And yeah, here's the thing. The whole thing is quite a hack. Um, because my solid, my voxelization is actually not solid. So we can go back here. We can actually go inside this bunny. Oh, okay, that's black. <laughs> that's not helpful. Uh, let's try our uh, rotating level again. All right, so, and oh, yeah, we can go inside here. So if particle ever makes it in here, then we have a problem. And of course that shouldn't happen, which uh, is why a lot of the, the typical text box uh, book implementations, they do a sign distance field. So they, at any point, they know like a way out again, because then they're like, ah, oh, I'm inside the solid, so just push me out again. Uh, so I'm not doing that um, because it was a bit too too expensive, mostly for my time. I, I think it, it should be possible to to do that also in real time. I get a nice sign distance field here. Um, the buzzword here would be jump flooding. Uh, I learned of that actually only while looking the whole thing up. And uh, yeah, we see here the embarrassed emotes because yeah, sometimes it doesn't work quite well. Uh, I actually can also show that in real time. Still have a little bit of time for that. Uh, ooh, that's the wrong one. Let's do. Let's do the short wave generator. Uh, oh yeah, I should enable the fluid rendering again. Oh, that's the particle index. Um, this no, I, I want those guys, and I don't want the boxes anymore. Right. So yeah, this this looks nice, uh, but every now and then we notice that. Yeah, we, yeah, here, yeah, this looks good, right? So there's a lot of empty space, a few weird explosions that shouldn't happen. Uh, but yeah, by rushing back in, yeah, there we see it. That, that's what we have in the screenshot. So these, these folks, they have no business actually here. They shouldn't be here, but, um, uh, or in there. On, on this way, it's only a few. Um, Right, but uh, yeah, what can you do? It's good enough for especially like for fast moving things. Um, we need need some more needs, needs some more thinking about. So, but how does it work? And this is where finally conservative rasterization comes in. So, for those of you who don't know what that is, I have a little screenshot here from a WebGPU demo, a WebGPU example actually. So the white outline triangle that is actually the what we want to render. And yeah, in this demo, it's just rendered on a low resolution target. And you see the black, uh, sorry, the, the blue inner triangle. That is what we would get with regular rasterization. And if we turn on conservative, then essentially everything what our white line touches will suddenly be filled. So yeah, as the name implies, it's conservative. And we do need that because otherwise we would get holes in our mesh. Because it turns out this is the, one of the few steps where we don't do a compute shader. We actually render the whole mesh just with a, a vertex and a fragment shader. Uh, but the trick is where, oh, from the start, right? So in the vertex shader, we decide for every triangle, what is the axis that you're biggest on? 
Once we decided that, then we go to the fragment shader. And oh yeah, I should add that we rotate the triangle so that we see its biggest side. So we now get fragments scheduled for all of these. And we know it's conservative, right? So like we even have the border. And in the fragment shader, we know where we're actually in space. Uh, and we have a fragment generator, so that's great. We can just write a voxel into the into our volume. And so that's that's actually uh, the, the tricky thing here. Like we're not actually writing out to a render target. The render target is just there to generate fragments. And yeah, that's it. And yeah, here we're actually like writing out also the velocity. Um, I'm using some packing here because it doesn't need to be super accurate. And that's it. It's uh, it's always a really light and it's incredibly fast. So. Um, yeah, voxelizations are useful for a lot of different things, so I uh, can recommend. And you can do it in WebGPU. <laughs> um, right, with that done, let's talk about um, the second implementation detail I wanted to shine a little light on. And that one is surprisingly hard. So this is all about the transfer from the particle world to the grid world. The other direction you can probably imagine is fairly easy. We just sample in the grid. But how do we average over several particles? So um, to add insert to interview, actually, we're not adding to like a regular grid, but to a staggered grid. So on a staggered grid, the velocities are on the corners uh, or on, on the sides, uh, which is super useful because if I now want a derivative in the middle, I just take the left and the right. Um, so it's it's a very popular te uh, technique for some of these simulations, uh, but it also means that like the area that we have for a cell is like much larger. And um, I visualize this here just to like give some context, right? So we're looking at this error, which is just an an x velocity, and that is the area that we're gathering particles in, actually, right? So all these particles we want to average their x velocity. Um, well, actually not average, like we want to weight them by the distance to this to get like a good sample of what's around us. And we, we set those like it's a linear, it's a linear weighting. So if we take two, like the, the, the neighbors, the four neighbors, and we would get like the whole thing again, right? So we, we don't want to overshoot. Uh, but yeah, as you can tell, like the, the area here is just like two, two grid cells in each direction. So it's exactly what you expect. But the problem is we need to do that now three times because of the nasty way our velocity vectors are defined. So how to do that fast on a GPU is actually not very trivial, right? So, I mean, we have two general ways, right? Like we can scatter, which means like, yeah, we have a compute shader that runs for every particle and they write into the cells. But yeah, there's this thing about float atomics. So yeah, it's still, it's still a hard topic actually, right? Like getting float atomics available in the API of your choice is a problem. Also, it wouldn't be necessarily fast because um, we would have a lot of contention there in memory. Um, so uh, yeah, so that's a problem. And the other way is to go through the cells instead of the particles. So we have a computer for every cell now, for every cell with a fluid, we could already predetermine that. And now we just gather for the particles from around. But yeah, how do we find the particles? Um, so yeah, there, there's different ways about how to go this, right? You could sort them and like create a spatial data structure. Uh, but I went with something else, um, which may or may not be original. So what I do first is I actually create um, a linked list volume, what I call it. So every so first we run a compute trader per particle, a very simple one. And what we do is we do an atomic exchange with a well, what I call the linked list volume. So this is a volume of pieces of pointers to uh, particles. And the particles then memorize like uh, the previous one. So yeah, that way we can create a little linked list for every um, grid point we're interested in. And uh, yeah, don't, don't get confused about the spacing here. Um, I got several times that it's very, very confusing with the staggered grid. Um, so, but yeah, once we have that, once we have this linked list, now we can actually uh, do a gathering, right? So we're looking again only at um, this little, Already down here. Um, and that one now wants to gather all the particles that we found here, 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 and here, like top left, well, to all the sides essentially. Uh, so eight in 3D. And so if we're now clever, and well, occasionally we are, uh, we can do a shared memory load here, right? So 
actually every like we have a run a compute trade on every cell uh, well I, I thread and uh, they all load to shared memory which now means that everybody only needs to do one load uh, from from the global memory from from our linked list uh, which is well as, as old wisdom tells us it's slow to to traverse um, and then with a rest read from shared memory and we have to remember like here this is 2d but actually this learns in 3d so this gives us a like, major performance win uh, is also quite hard though to optimize to the extent I hadn't done that um, because if you know a bit of your shared memory there you always get these issues with bank conflicts um, so yeah I actually had never looked into that I'm not sure how to do that properly but it already gives a huge speed up in the primitive way I've implemented it right and that's that's how the velocity to grid works um, just again here maybe in the profile oh I crashed again it, it really doesn't like the profile of you um, well, it starts quickly. Um, by the way, it only starts so quickly because of some caching for the shaders. I said they are all reloaded. Um, also means that I need to compile them. I mean, it's a lot of them. So actually, only when I change them, um, they uh, they are recompiled. Right. And what I wanted to shine a light on is yeah, right here we have the transfer, and we do that for every dimension. First step, we have an extra clear process. But yeah, essentially, like for every time we clear the linked list grid, we create the particles in the linked list, and then we gather. And you can see the gather step is unsurprisingly the slowest, um, because here we, uh, here we do, like we need to traverse all these linked lists. Whereas in the uh, create party linked list, we only need to do a single atomic exchange, and also nice things only one cell, as opposed to a pure, a pure scatter approach where a single particle would need to write all to all relevant cells. All right, um, enough of this one. I'm running out of time. The pressure solver. So the pressure solver, to remind you, was the thing that enforces that our diversion is zero, so that we don't make up new fluid or um, or, or lose it. And um, yeah, so the, the mathematical details are not super trivial, I found. Uh, so I left a link here. Um, because Austin did a much better job in his uh, very impressive Vectri or fluid solver. It's a very similar technique, actually. It's a flip uh, fluid solver. Uh, you could call that a predecessor, actually, of the APEC. Right. And uh, yeah, some details there. Uh, you can look that up into your old time when we uh, publish the slides. But what I found interesting about this one is the solver is iterative, right? So how often do I need to run it? And what we have here is like error, error graphs over time. As I mentioned, I have two solvers, so we have the whole thing twice. But they're doing the same thing almost. Uh, one just runs on density, the, the other one on divergence or rather velocity. So, and you see all these spikes here, right? So like, how do we actually make sure that we run the right amount of iterations? And uh, the first thought I, oops, the first thought I had was like, yeah, just read it back on CPU and then, and then we know, right? Then we know how many compute uh, dispatch calls we, we need to do for the solver. Uh, yeah, it turns out, um, well, we, we can't wait on that result because then the whole thing wouldn't be interactive anymore, right? And like, then the CPU would run in lockstep with GPU, so we can't do that. Uh, so then I tried to predict it. And yeah, it turns out this is true. Like, especially when you have a splashy scene, it doesn't work out. There's too many spikes. Um, so what I settled with instead is like, I always send, in this case, 64 dispatch indirect calls. And every, every so often, I, I tell the GPU, like, hey, it's time to compute the error again, which is also not free, actually. And if the error is low enough, then I just, like, clear out the dispatch indirect buffer, um, like the, the, the buffer that the dispatch indirect is using to determine how many things to actually compute. So that means, of course, that we still have quite a sizable overhead uh with the remaining iterations but it's much better than not doing it right so like they become super fast and again we can see that over here uh, so if we expand this right we see there's um 32 iterations right now for this one and all right crashed again oh it's a bad day okay there we go again and oh yeah there you see like this one should actually have more iterations so it's fairly inaccurate um, let's do a quieter scene. Oh yeah, uh, I have a very quiet scene for this one. So it's a very good scene for debugging. <laughs> right. 
this is what should always behave. I, and I can tell you it not always did. And right now it's a bit wiggly here. So something is going on there. Uh, but more interestingly, right, like, yeah, we don't need to do a lot of solving, so that's great. And then if we look at, oh, here we have our profiler. Uh, where's the solver? Right, so there's some setup, and then we have all these iterations, and we see like the first one still takes 0 0.1 milliseconds, and the other ones they much faster. All right, so like we reduced the overhead quite a bit. Uh, it's sadly not zero. Uh, so that's something to be worked on. There, there must be a better solution. There's probably some more clever way of dispatching these days that I just don't know about. Um, right, yeah, and with that, I'm actually already at the end of my talk. Uh, so if you want to learn more, I, I wrote a few of these details down in my readme on project web page on GitHub. And I have this humongous uh, GitHub gist where I like, gathered resources and links for quite a while. I'm not surprised if they're already dead, uh, some of them. Uh, please report if you find some. And uh, yeah, you can find a lot of resources there from a lot of people that know this much, much better than I do. And with that, I'm at the end. Thank you so much. Thanks, Andreas. That was amazing. I think the talk has a perfect mix of education and entertaining, and I loved all the videos. I would describe Thanks it so as much. a sufficiently advanced technology, also known as magic, because this is something that I would love to delve on, and I think you're doing a great job at it. Um, I remember first time you showed on our forums and or on uh, our chat and showed your GIF image. I didn't believe that. Because at that time we were just drawing triangles <laughs> mostly. And you just showed up with this huge view simulation and rendering and it actually worked as a GIF image and like it blew my mind back in the day. Um, also, the, you, the way you present math is original and uh, refreshing. So thank you for that. Uh, I, I'm excited to see in the future, maybe when we get some particle systems rendering, that we can do some collaboration with your simulation to get them nice. So looking forward to it. And I'm going to proceed to the questions. The first technical question, you are using 3D textures. Um, are you using read-write storage textures, or are you doing the ping pong? Uh, I'm doing read-write storage everywhere. Um, the problem with ping pong on uh, 3D textures is actually that you then need to do every slice uh, because you can't like bind a whole volume as a render target, uh, which kind of excludes this. Also, yeah, it needs a lot more memory. Right. Um, but uh, actually, here's an interesting point. I would. I thought several times during the development, I should switch everything to buffers. Because the problem with 3D textures is you never know the real layout on GPU, and you get very odd performance characteristics for a lot of operations. And I started things where I like, would just like, flip the volume in like, different dimensions and makes, of course, a huge difference, right? Because the, the, the way the, GPU, the textures are swizzled is different. And I had a really hard time finding uh, resources on that. I think I've made a few notes on in my readme actually about that. Uh, it's quite nasty. So uh, if you try this, consider buffers because also then it would run on metal. Right. Speaking of metal, is that the only thing that blocks metal, or is it also the like conservative rasterization or something else? Uh, right. So yeah, there's a couple of things. Like the volume text is the biggest. Thing. It's like the elephant in the room that makes it very hard to run it on metal. Um, the conservative rasterization is another one. Uh, I'm not so sure, like, I think we have, do have push constants on metal at this point, but yeah, you could, I mean, they're easy to emulate, if not, right? Um, what else could there be? I, I think that is the main thing. Uh, at some point, I, I considered subgroups, um, but didn't go there. So I think at this point, that would be Vulcan only. Um, but yeah, yeah that, those two things, I believe. Okay. Yeah, we currently we don't have push constants on metal because we rewrote all the things, all the things, and didn't uh, roll them out. So we'll get them soon, hopefully. I I asked about the three D storage textures because readable storage textures are not a part of the Web GPU proper. So this is also a native only extension, which means that the the system is great on some native platforms, but is not going to run on the web anytime soon, at least I guess. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, arguably, like if. If I would try this for the web, I would implement something new, I believe. Like porting this over to the web is, is icky. Uh, and 
you mentioned a single pass in the voxelization. Yes. That surprised the hell of me. Um, so you were rendering, like, I'm trying to imagine if you were just slicing the mesh, then you would have a, a pass per Z axis, for example, of the mesh, right? You have many passes to voxelize yeah. it. So you're doing something different. Yeah. So actually, the every triangle is really only rendered once, but it is rendered on the side that it would generate the most fragments. Right. So the trick is that we, since we're not actually rendering into a texture, we can just like we, we completely make up the locations where we write to, right? Because we use image storage for that. Um, it's actually a very small. It's like two very small shaders. It's it's surprisingly small. Uh, it's the second time I implemented this. I implemented this several years ago already. Uh, it's always a light. But back then I didn't have conservative rasterization, which makes the thing very complex because then you need to expand your triangles and you it gets really right. icky. Um, so yeah, there's that. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's actually, a, I, I think there's like some NVIDIA resources about the technique as well. I didn't come up with this, obviously. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, if you want to, if, if somebody asks for a bigger write-up, maybe I can do that. It might be useful for other people as well. Yeah, and uh, Andreas was the one driving the conservative rasterization into WGPU. So this is great. Thank you. Unsurprisingly. <laughs> Um, you mentioned the shader cache. What are you caching? Uh, I'm uh, I'm caching the right. So like I compile my my GLSA shaders with um, uh, with shader C. Uh, so what I'm caching is actually the Spire V. Um, yeah, I, I forgot about to demonstrate that actually how the the reloading works because um, absolutely, if you do anything like that, you need dynamic shader reloading. Like it it mm. makes everything awesome because uh, like experimentation time gets goes so much down is, is amazing. I see. Great. And, um, uh, last question for, from me, at least, is what is a tricky one? What's the goal for this? Is this just like, I want to play with simulation? Or do you envision it being involved into something else? It, it really is just a, like a play project. I, when I started, this, I thought like, oh, maybe this could be useful. But yeah, I, I explicitly geared it towards not being that, right? Because the the constraints that come in are completely different then. And uh, like, I mean, as, as you saw, like the, the whole thing is interactive. It's not like fully, uh, fully real time. I, I guess it would be on a more powerful uh, graphics card. Like that is on a 1070 Ti. Um, so I, I guess on a more modern one, this would work also in, in real time, but uh, it's pretty much excluded that you implement that into a game as is, because like you saw, it's like a small tank. So you can't really use it for that. Um, also, it takes like much too uh, too big part of uh, the frame. Uh, so I guess the only like useful way of like thinking about that particular approach would be to like to have like a VFX with forced iteration time. I think that would be like a a use case uh, for for the approach I went there. Um, but yeah, as I, as I showed, like I, from the start, I also like kept in mind, like yeah, this may not quite get to real time. So I always wanted to have this way of like dialing back and like okay, this is just like one frame after the other, and like I can skip forward and all these things. Uh, but yeah, um, to answer the actual question, like it was really just for playing around. Cool, thanks. Um, so the recent many questions others asked on the chat, but I have one more. Um, you you mentioned the timing for the scene where about uh, four and five milliseconds per stage. Um, and then they are going to be combined like 10 milliseconds per generated uh, simulation, I guess. So what, where are we talking about? How many particles are there that you are simulating? Uh, yeah, yeah, the obvious question. Uh, I actually <laughs> just this morning hacked into the scene that it tells me there. So uh, on, on the scene that we saw in the beginning, it is, just give me a second, uh, it's about 1.2 million particles. Uh, but the volume resolution is surprisingly low. It's 128 by 64 by 64. Um, I have a bigger scene that doesn't like run sort of it like little steps on my machine um, where I double the, the volume resolution. Uh, but yeah, I didn't get to show that either. Uh, another time, maybe. All right. So more than a million of particles. Yeah. Um, yeah the, the, the thing is like the. Oh, apologies. Go ahead. No, no, no. Continue. Um, the problem is generally like, 
usually in these simulations you have about eight particles per grid cell. That's why it explodes so much. That's why the the volume sound, the resolution sounds so small and the particle resolution sounds so big. That is why. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. So please a round of applause for Andres. This was an amazing talk. Thank um, you so much. We are gonna proceed to closing because it's been a while. And um, I would like to specifically thanks our speakers. Thank you guys for showing your work. It is amazing. I love that you were able to do that. I hope we're gonna continue doing that. We are thinking once in two or three months based on um, how much we have people wanting to show their work. So maybe we'll hear something about the REN3 GPU side, or maybe we'll hear some non-WGPU projects showing up, like RAFX architecture. I would love to see that. Um, so tune in for the news. Um, another special thanks to Forrest for organizing all the behind the scenes and technical and uh, general help here. We wouldn't be able to do it without you. Thank you. So thanks all the listeners. That's everything for us for now. Hopefully we'll see you again. Bye.